pleasure to get to chat with the author of one of my very most favorite books, uh, Catherine Ebon. She's going to be joining us here in a second. And uh, if you if you take a generic prescription, a generic drug, or if you have a family member or a friend who takes a generic prescription medication, then I think you probably want to hear what Miss Ebon has to say. Uh, she's going to be joining me in just a second. If, if, you're, if your mom or your sister-in-law or your next door neighbor takes a generic medication, send them a text or an email or just go get them by the hair of the head and drag them in front of the monitor because I promise you they want to hear what this, uh, the right honorable Catherine Ebon has to say. She's going to be joining me here in just a second. Hey, guys, tell me where, where in the world are you watching from? What city, what state, what country? Last time we did this, we had people from Australia and Cambodia and Norway watching. So I always love seeing where you're watching from. Tell me where you're at. I hope no one is, has lapsed into clinical insanity from the social isolation. Hopefully, this live video will give you a little bit of inter entertainment and hopefully a lot of bit of knowledge that you can use to improve your health. I do this live uh, Wednesday live at five every week uh, on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm thinking about adding an extra Monday live at five. Uh, tell me what you think about that in the comments. If you'd like for me to do this two days a week, I don't mind at all. I enjoy talking to intelligent, articulate people. All right, let me see if I can get our guest to join us. Catherine, can you hear me? Uh, I can. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi, guys. You don't know this, but the backstory is uh, Catherine and I have been trying to get this together for months. I've been <laughs> I've been biting at the bit trying to introduce you to her. And uh, one technical difficulty and then a, the small matter of a virus. And it kind of got put put on the back burner for a minute. But here we are. Finally, Catherine Ebon, the, the author of Bottle of Lies. And this is her, her book, Bottle of Lies, is my second favorite book that has lies in the title. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what my favorite is. Uh, Catherine, it's such a such a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, tell the listeners who hopefully they've already, they've already read your book, but if not, tell us a little bit about you and why we should yeah. care about what you discovered. Yeah. So um, I'm an investigative journalist. Uh, I'm based in New York. And um, I spent a decade um, reporting on problems that patients were having with generic drugs, side effects, uh, relapses, um, a feeling that they had been stabilized previously, then they were switched on their medication and were not getting better. Um, and I was initially um, contacted via a tip uh, from a radio show host who said he was inundated with patients who were complaining about this. And uh, I started investigating and that investigation ended up taking me to four continents, interviewing hundreds of people and obtaining thousands of pages of internal documents from leading generic drug companies from inside of the FDA. Uh, and I was ultimately able to put together this really incredible story about endemic fraud in the distant generic drug plants that we all rely on. I mean, that's really, for, for starters right out of the gates, that's one of the surprising things about this, which is we are largely dependent on manufacturing plants in India and China that make our low cost medicine. 90% uh, of the drugs that Americans take are generic. 40% um, of the, the finished doses come from India and 80% of the active ingredient in all our drugs, brand or generic, come from overseas. Yeah. And during the, the first few years of my practice was there were still lots of name brands. Generics were starting to become a thing, but they, they weren't. But then later in later years of my practice, I, I was able to manage almost all my patients almost all the time mm -hmm. with a generic option, which saved right. them hundreds of dollars a year. And back then, before I read your book, I thought I was doing a great thing by basically giving my patients what I assumed yeah. was equivalent to the name brand medication. 
now looking back, obviously, you know, I, I was trying, I, was, I thought I was doing a good job, but obviously that probably, I mean, I, there wasn't another option because if I prescribed the name brand, they couldn't afford it. So they just weren't going to take it. So I prescribed the right. generic, which was, you know, $4 a month or $10 for three months. And at least they would fill it and take it. And so it really puts doctors, it puts patients, it puts every, and, and pharmacists in just a terrible bind. Yeah. It's really, it's, it's a dilemma. It's not a yeah. problem. There's no solution really, because if you're a doctor, what are you going to do? Prescribe a name brand that they can't afford or a generic that they right. can afford, but it may be adulterated. And so, uh, so you, you took on this challenge and this had to be stressful. This had to be a it, little bit crazy. I mean, it was crazy. You know, I, when I started down this road, I had no idea that I would be essentially investigating the Indian generic drug industry, which is where my investigation did lead me. I mean, when I started out, I was looking into patient complaints. I was interviewing doctors. Um, and what I found was a very sort of porous set of regulations that the FDA uses to evaluate the quality of generic drugs. Um, it is relying on company data. It's relying <clears throat> on inspections at overseas plants that they announce month, months in advance. So the plants know they're coming and get prepared. Um, it has a, there's a very sort of wide range in the bioequivalent standard um, where, uh, you know, you can be sort of uh, far above or below the absorption into the blood of the brand name drug, surprisingly so. So it's not exact, it's, you know, approximate. Um, but what really stunned me was the extent to which these generic companies are gaming the system. They are altering laboratory data to make their drugs appear compliant when they are not. Um, you know, so I have, in, I interviewed whistleblowers, um, and, uh, you know, just hundreds of people to put together this book, Bottle of Lies. And in it, the central character, the story I tell is of a whistleblower who ended up bringing down India's largest drug company. Yeah. And as a, and so as a doctor, as a pharmacist, as a patient, you, we would just, we just assume that the FDA has got their eyes on everything and that the AMA or the, uh, the American Pharmacists Association is watching all this stuff and they're probably testing every batch, you know, to make sure that everything's okay. Turns out <clears throat> that's actually not the case at all. The, yeah. the, but effectively what they were doing was, uh, and all the small business owners out there, wouldn't you love this setup? They said, hey, we're just, we just want you to self-report on yourself. Yeah. And, and every now and then we will investigate your, your facilities, but we're going to give you a a month's heads up before we yeah, come. That's right. Anybody, anybody see a problem with that? Cause that, I mean, you know, it's yeah. A small business owner be like, yeah, I'll take that bet. Sounds great. You know, it's really surprising. I mean, most people assume that the FDA is testing the drugs it approves and actually that is not the case. They do not have any systematic testing program uh, for the drugs they approve. Now what just hold on. I want you to say that again. Everybody listen very carefully to yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. So the way that they figure out is a drug okay for every all of us to take is they um, review data provided by the company. And then if it's an overseas plant, they will uh, contact the plant, say two months in advance, say, is it convenient for you folks to let us in? And they set a date. And really under the way the system is structured, the FDA investigators uh, wind up as the invited guests of the plant. And then the FDA further invites um, the companies in question to arrange ground transportation uh, and local travel and hotel accommodations for FDA investigators, uh, You know, which is not at all the dynamic that you would want of a, you know, rigorous agency inspecting to get the, you know, picture of true conditions inside of the plant. That's just, can you give us, during your investigation, give us a, an example or two of just the most egregious thing that you found that just blew you away 
uh, give us a couple of examples so we can kind of understand the, the, the dastardliness of this. Well, you know, so the book, first of all, my book, Bottle of Lies, is, is a narrative. I mean, it tells the story of a number of characters, uh, people who worked to expose this. Uh, and one of them is an FDA investigator named Peter Baker. And the book opens with, and not to give too much away, but um, opens with an inspection he makes at a uh, Indian drug plant that makes sterile injectable pharmaceuticals for the US market. So for example, uh, adenosine, if I'm saying that correctly, which is an injectable cardiac drug, um, he, he finds a, a, a plant employee trying to smuggle out a garbage bag of documents and actually chases him down the hall. So it's a, it's a low speed chase scene inside a sterile pharmaceutical plant. So they're both um, wearing their spacesuits and one's chasing the other. Yeah, I mean, it's just crazy. And he retrieves the bag and in it, he finds um, batch records that have been shredded. And those records indicate that there were metallic particles in vials of insulin, which the company ended up clearing and shipping to patients, even though they knew the drugs were adulterated and dangerous for humans. Um, and it turned out that, that the plant was manufacturing in a sort of hidden area of the plant. That was the real area where they were making these pharmaceuticals with um, equipment that had been corroded and not repaired. Uh, and, and that was also where they were making some of the injectable drugs for the U.S. market. Wow. You know, wow. Yeah. 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 And before any of you guys out there in the U.S. get carried away, this this is not uh, a conspiracy for, by the Indian big pharma manufacturers. They're, they're sending these drugs to every country. And in fact, according to Catherine Ebon's book, Bottle of Lies, countries that have less regulation than the U.S. are actually getting even worse quality yeah. medications and, and as a generic. Is that right? Yeah. So this was this was a very um, this was a very troubling thing that I uncovered, which is that these uh, plants routinely do something called dual track production. Um, what that means is they make one level of quality for the more regulated markets and lower quality for the less regulated markets, which essentially amounts to a manufacturing standard of whatever they can get away with. So, you know, if, if a batch does not um, uh, qualify for, you know, if, if it's been um, somehow contaminated in some way or it's deemed to be ineffective or the doses are out of specification, it's supposed to be destroyed under good manufacturing practices. But that rarely happens because there's usually a market where they can dump these drugs where they won't be caught. And that's a calculation that is routinely made. Um, but there's a really terrible consequence of that. I mean, of course, there is a terrible consequence for patients in the less regulated markets that are taking these drugs. But there's, there's also a consequence for all of us, uh, which is that these public health researchers are now linking these, uh, the, you know, the big prevalence of these substandard generics, linking them to drug resistant infections, right? Because if you're, think about it, if you're underdosing a continent of people with poor quality drugs, right? Then, then all the, you know, bacteria and the infectious diseases you're trying to, you know, stop and stem are basically strengthening. And that is ultimately impacting all of us. Um, so, you know, there is a very major public health consequence to the, to the practice of dual track production. It's quite perilous. So I had, even as a doctor, I had always assumed that the FDA probably pulls every 50th container ship or something and does some spot checking to make sure that what is going to wind up on the, mm -hmm. the prescription bottle is actually what's in the pill or the capsule. And you're saying, to your knowledge, that doesn't happen? No, it does not happen. I mean, there is no systematic program of random testing. 
So when all these drugs and these huge cargo ships are shipped into San Francisco or New York or Miami, there's no FDA agent there who's like, okay, let me have that box. I'm going to do a spot check. That, that literally doesn't happen. Right. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen on a routine basis. You know, drugs are tested if there's a whistleblower, if there's something specifically they're investigating or that they deem to be wrong, but it does not happen on a routine basis. Wow. So, you know, what the, what this means is that we are our, our generic drugs, which are being made thousands of miles away from here, are essentially regulated on an honor system. Company provided data, company organized tours for the investigators, no independent system of verification, uh, which is just nuts. And and to make it even more crazy, um, then there are then there are um, academics who go and you know there aren't many studies, uh, independent studies into um, the quality of generics and how they're performing. But right. I mean, there is, for example, one guy at Harvard who's like. Let's see if they're equivalent. And then he 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 publishes studies saying the good news is generics are every bit as equivalent as the brand name drugs. But what he's relying on to come to that determination is the data provided by the generic drug companies to the FDA. Right? Wow. wow. That's so the that's the data there. He basically published a report that said Okay, guys, no need to worry. The fox said that the hen house is very safe. Don't worry. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, so it's like everything is within this loop of, of company-sponsored data. But what my book really blows the lid off of is that there is endemic fraud in the generic drug industry and there is widespread uh, falsification and manipulation of quality data. So, you know, take a step back. So what does that mean for U.S. consumers? It means that um, consumers are getting generic drugs, which we know have been contaminated with glass particles, contain metallic fragments, um, are not bioequivalent, so they don't have the same therapeutic effect in some cases as brand name drugs, um, or they have toxic impurities. And, and just as one example of that, um, millions of Americans found out that generic blood pressure medication they were taking, Valsartan and Losartan, uh, had been contaminated with a carcinogen uh, called NDMA. Now, what's incredible about this is that um, one of the big Chinese active ingredient companies that was, um, you know, was found to be uh, shipping out this this. Uh, contaminated um, active ingredient, an FDA inspector actually went into that plant in 2017, discovered that they were not investigating impurity spikes in their own drugs. So under good manufacturing practices, you know, the drug makers are required to investigate any quality problems they have and do a root cause analysis and, and determine what went wrong. So the FDA investigator wrote back to headquarters and said, you know, this is really serious and I recommend that this plant be sanctioned uh, under what's called official action indicated. It's a notification saying we got to take the most serious steps here. And the FDA bureaucrats downgraded that recommendation. As a result of which this plant continued shipping this ingredient with a carcinogen in it for a whole nother year. Now, I, I know that you may not know the answer to this, but just as a rational, intelligent human, mm -hmm. why would they downgrade that? Was there some reason that that you know of? Or if not, I mean, what motivation? Why would you possibly do that? So here is a motivation which I describe in the book, which is the FDA is under pressure from Congress to show that they are approving lots of low cost medicine, right? And that this low cost medicine, uh, because there's drug shortages, there's all kinds of problems, right? There's been no meaningful regulation of brand name drug prices. So there's tremendous political pressure to show that they are approving generics as fast as they can. And there's a plentiful supply of these low cost medicines. 
So the problem is if you impose sanctions on these plants, you are restricting the flow of those drugs, right? Those sanctions have repercussions. You're saying, hey, the plant can't just keep shipping this stuff because we know there's serious problems. We got to stop the flow. Uh, and they're very reluctant to do that. But the result of that is that these plants with quality problems keep uh, pouring out uh, compromised drugs. And, you know, let me just, let me just add, um, Ken, that, that in the middle of this coronavirus uh, pandemic, we're really in trouble. You know, and now the FDA is basically lifting sanctions on Indian and Chinese plants as quickly as they can because there's all of these ingredients and there are all these drugs in short supply. Um, so, you know, this pandemic has really exposed how dangerous our dependency is. You know? Yeah, and, and so yeah. again, we're in this dilemma, right? Because we want to get medications to sick patients mm -hmm. as quickly as we possibly can. But the underlying assumption on all this, but from at every level, from the doctor to the to the pharmacist to the patient, is that this pill that I just took out of this bottle actually contains right. what it says on the label, right. and it, it quite possibly doesn't. And and even and even antibiotics. I mean, you talk about that in the book, mm -hmm. and so I don't know if we know any facts about yeah. uh, hydroxychloroquine or any of these mm -hmm. things, that, you know, azithromycin. But it's entirely possible the same thing could be happening here. And the U.S., the FDA is actually lifting <clears throat> lifting regulations instead of being more stringent. Yeah. Well, actually, um, uh, a lot has been written about that because they're lifting import restrictions on plants that, where they found data falsification. And so you're saying that, that, that drug manufacturing plants in other countries who have already, it's already proven. Oh, yeah. That they have been up to this foolishness. Yeah. We're lifting their sanctions so that they can make drugs for, for U.S. citizens and citizens of the world. That's today, right. Even though we know that they're capable. That's right. Of yeah, that is, that is happening as we speak. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I will have um, I would just say that, you know, if people want to follow me on Twitter at Catherine Eban, I'm going to be I'm reporting on this now and I have a lot more coming out. So, um, you know, I got a story in the works right now. Uh, but yeah, this is really like a very, very uh, troubling time for our drug supply. I mean, it's a troubling time. And, you know, we are in, you know, this is a terrible situation. But just regarding the topic we're talking about, um, this is really dangerous. Yeah, I, that's crazy. So who exactly is failing us? Is it, is it the, the, I mean, because... You know, the, the, the plant manufacturers, I mean, the managers and the owners, if you can make a cheaper product and charge a higher price, you know, I mean, still it's unethical. It's, it's yeah. illegal, but you kind of get their motivation. But who who is letting us down? Who's not doing their job? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, first and foremost, I would say the FDA is not doing their job. I mean, their job is to ensure that every drug that's on the U.S. market is safe and effective. That's their job. I 100%, and, yeah, 100 yeah. agree. And yeah. so it's the FDA who's ultimately responsible yeah. for ensuring that what it says on that prescription bottle label is actually yeah. what's in that damn pill. And they're right. just, they're, they literally walked away and they're not doing their job. Right. You know, and I would say another failure here, you know, our political system we have had no meaningful price regulation of brand name drugs. People can't afford brand name drugs. And that fact has made us so much more dependent on these very low cost providers overseas. You know, so there is a political failure there. There's no doubt, you know, and then look, I mean, these, these companies are purporting to make drugs under what are called good manufacturing practices, GMP. You know, that is part of the regulation. If they, if they want to sell their drugs into the US market, they have to comply with US regulations. They understand very clearly what those regulations are. And, you know, my book is really the story of how they figured out how to game those regulations and fool regulators who, are making themselves available to be fooled. 
through a very ineffective system of inspections and oversight. I'm, I'm trying to, to interview you, but you need to understand uh, this is very triggering for me. This really pisses me off. And that's why I wanted to have you on, but I'm trying to shut up and let you talk because people need to hear what you have to say, but you do not understand how much I want to rant right now and just go a little bit nuts for a minute, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to continue because <laughs> you people need to hear what you have to say. How long would you say, how long has this been going on? Well, you know, globalization, I mean, the globalization of our drug supply really started around 2000. By 2004, this is incredible. I mean, if you if you go and get an antibiotic for your kid at a pharmacy, it is almost guaranteed that it was not made in the United States. We make almost none of our own antibiotics anymore. The last penicillin plant in the US closed in 2004, closed. Um, by 2004, the U.S. had more uh, manufacturing plants to inspect overseas than it does within U.S. borders, right? And, you know, I testified in front of a congressional com commission in August, and there was a Pentagon official who testified that same hearing and said, you know, this is a national security risk, right? How can we be so dependent on India and China? Uh, for our pharmaceuticals. Now, fast forward, you know, here we are in the middle of this insane pandemic and uh, people are scrambling for pharmaceutical supplies and we are scouring the earth. You know, the FDA is trying to find sources of drugs that are in short supply, uh, you know, and we don't make them here. Well, now, so, so far we've talked about just generics and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I hope you're prepared for this because when we mm -hmm. talked a month or two, or two ago, I said, what about name brands? Mm -hmm. Where do they get their ingredients from? Where are they manufactured? You know, and I know there's probably different uh, manufacturing mm -hmm. concerns in different countries, but what's the story with name brands? Right. So that, that's the crazy part of this. You know, if, if your listeners after hearing this, after reading Bottle of Lies, and they say, I never want to take another generic again. 80% of the active ingredients in all of our brand name drugs, in all of our drugs, come from overseas. You know, they're made in China. They're made in India. Um, so so we, even the top dollar mm -hmm. that you see advertised on television, yeah. the bulk of their ingredients come from China, India, and other, other countries. Yeah, they do. So, but what that means is that as a consumers, we are really dependent on the vigilance of the company that's making the finished dose of the drug, right? right? They're the ones that are procuring the active ingredient. They're the ones that are required to test it. So then you're in this sort of question of, of who do you trust, right. you know? Um, who do you trust as a consumer? Who can you sue? You know, right. I mean, right. one of the one of the really difficult things about this and in the, in the book focuses in a lot of detail on this crazy investigation of a company called Rambaxi, which was India's biggest drug company. So, you know, as the FDA was investigating this company for data fraud, how do you how do you, you know, um, depose witnesses? How do you get documents? How do you serve a search warrant? Um, you know, at a company that is headquartered in Gurgaon, India, right? So when you think about the fact that we have outsourced our life, the manufacture of our life-saving drugs to other countries, what mechanisms uh, for accountability are there? You know, if you, I'm sure you remember the heparin crisis when, um, when you know, heparin, which is a blood thinner uh, and it was coming from uh, China, and it was made by Baxter and it was adulterated. It was an economic adulteration because they were trying to increase the yield of the drug. Over 80 Americans died because of that product and no one was ever held accountable because China would not cooperate with the investigation, wow. right? So that is the kind of underlying problem. Wow, yeah, that's a big problem. And so I, I, just the human nature of the situation, <clears throat> it makes sense that a name brand like Merck or Pfizer 
they've at least got a reputation to lose and they have a, a right. U.S. presence. So there is a corporate entity you can sue mm -hmm. if you feel like you've been wrong. But when it comes to the generic manufacturers, who the heck even knows who they are? Well, that that's exactly right. So I think, you know, I think that um, uh, a name brand, just because of their reputational risks, provides a little bit of protection for consumers. But let me just be clear, which is, you know, as an investigative journalist, and I've been doing this for two decades, and I've done plenty of investigations of big pharma. You know, I am, I take no money from them. I have investigated them. Um, but one thing that I found is that a lot of the um, uh, sort of fraud schemes inside of big pharma tend to emanate from the sales and marketing departments where they're trying to expand usage for a drug, right? They're trying to get everybody in America to take Oxycontin. And so they make claims that it's not addictive and, you know, they want, uh, you know, pediatricians to give it to kids, um, uh, you know, and that's horrible. It's, it's different though than, you know, what I investigated um, in Bottle of Lies is actual alteration of laboratory results, faking laboratory results in order to show regulators that your product is equivalent. So as an example of this, you know, the Indian company Rambaxi, they were actually getting their employees to smuggle brand name samples of drugs into India, right, in suitcases that they procured. And then they would test the brand name samples and they would use that data and submit that data to the FDA to show them that their drug was equivalent. So they were testing the brand name drug and lo and behold, their data was perfect. It sure. looked like the drug was absolutely equivalent because they were testing the brand name drug. Back in my residency training, we were told that a generic drug has to be plus or minus 5%. So 95% mm -hmm. equivalent. That's what we were told by our professors and I'm sure our professors also believe that the FDA actually assured that that was true. I, I don't think any of us had any idea that there was literally no one watching the fox as he guarded the in-house. This is just ridiculous. And I've seen a bunch of comments go by. Guys, we're not telling you to not take generic drugs. No. We're not telling you not to take prescription drugs. That's a conversation right. you need to have with your doctor. Right. But what I feel compelled to do, and obviously what Ms. Abon feels compelled to do, is to tell you the truth of the matter. So at least right. that you're just not you're just not blind and stupid. At least you know what the heck's going on in the right. world that you currently reside in. You know, just just to add to that, so um I have a link uh on my website, which actually I should give you Ken so you can put up for your listeners. I've got um, your I've got a link to right. your book and the, okay. your, your Time magazine article yeah. and your website in the show notes. Okay. So on my website, I have a guide to investigating your own drugs. And even though there is no perfect solution to this, there are things that a consumer can look at and do to try to respond to this information. So, so listen up, guys. If you're yeah. on a generic medication, here's yeah. how you can change yeah. what's happening to you. Yeah. So number the number one step in that um, is, you know, if I, if I said to your listeners, so you take a medication every month, do you know who made it? I bet you most people don't. Most people don't actually look at the, who the manufacturer is. And I think the reason is because the FDA has told us that all the manufacturers are the same, right? That they're all interchangeable. Any generic they approve is the same as any other. The Any generic is equivalent to the brand. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, we go to pharmacies every month, let's say, and you might be switched between different brands of a generic, different versions of a generic, yeah. different now manufacturers. Many patients complain about that through the year. Yeah. These Absolutely. don't work like those other ones do. And right. I always thought the patient was just being silly. All right. I'm, I'm honest. I admit that I was wrong. Yeah. Until I read your book, I thought, uh, mm -hmm. that Mr. is just being silly. She thinks the blue pill is better than the white pill. They're all the yeah. same because the FDA assures that. Yeah. And, and you know something? I've had so many doctors say that to me. They're like, I feel kind of bad because I thought my patients were just whiners and complainers. And now I'll think about it differently. You know, so the, the number one step is you need to know 
which manufacturer is making your drug because if it works and you feel fine and you're you're stabilized you want to stay on that manufacturer but if it doesn't work you want to switch and you can't do any of that unless you know who's actually making the drug yeah so and that's, how, that's so on your website there's a way that people can kind of tease that out yeah and and, yeah. and to walk through the steps but let me just also say this which is one of the number one questions that i've gotten from readers is how can I know where my drug was made? And right now, you can't. You can't actually know. You can find out the manufacturer. You can find out where their corporate headquarters is. But you can't. It's very hard to figure out where the manufacturing plant is. Um, yeah. So what I have said, I mean, what is really needed here for consumers is um, country of origin labeling for drugs and drug ingredients, right? Um, because how is it that how is it that you can walk into Whole Foods and know where your apple came from, and you can't even figure out where your life saving medicine was made? That's nuts. Yeah. And I mean, we don't expect you guys to go and inspect the factory yourself, because mm -hmm. even the FDA finds that practice to be <laughs> troublesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 incredibly difficult. You know, you can't really. Um, manufacturers always say that where their drugs are made is proprietary information. Why should that be proprietary information? Why yeah. shouldn't we know? I think if if we implemented that requirement and consumers really began to understand this, you'd see manufacturing return to the U.S. Yeah, is my guess. And, yeah, and and there might be a, a the your prescription medication might cost a buck or two more per month yeah. uh, because of the higher manufacturing right. costs. But at right. least there would be somebody that you could sue if they were adulterating your medicine right. and currently you as a as a u.s citizen yeah. definitely you have no legal recourse yeah that, that is any, it's not a meaningful legal recourse unless you want to file suits in multiple countries or something yeah I mean, nobody can do that yeah it's it's very very difficult you know and our and our government i mean you know there's no we don't have a u.s attorney in in new delhi who can you know authorize a, a you know a, a search warrant uh so we're really you know we're really flying blind yeah marlena said she tried to find the source of her meds from her mm -hmm. pharmacist and yeah. he got mad at her got frustrated with her uh and 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 so I, yeah i could totally see mm -hmm. if I were a doctor and you're like well where's this medicine come from i'd be like mm -hmm. hey, i don't know uh, we trust the pharmacist and the pharmacy yeah. the fda you know, and, and evidently the FDA is trusting the drug manufacturer in China or India or other countries. So really it's a it's a it's a Ponzi trust scheme where everybody's <laughs> trusting the guy upstream, but really at the end there's nobody who's trustworthy. You know, I think that's really well put. It is. It is a Ponzi trust scheme. Yes, it is. Yeah. So the, the, there's a there's a, a resource on your website where they can go and try to tease out yeah. where their prescription drug came from. And then your other advice was if you're on a prescription medication, and it seems to be working, then try to yeah. stick with that brand if you can deduce yeah. or introduce which brand you're actually taking. Uh, you know, I had I had a little bit of reservation about talking about this because the average person just sitting at home right now watching this, I mean we're basically presenting them with information that's scaring the crap out of them, but there's not really anything they can do to change it. And I, I, you know, I'm a guy, I like to say, okay, here's the problem and here's how you fix it. Step yeah. one, step two, step three. And yeah. I mean, this is a big deal. And this is one of those call your congressman thing and, mm -hmm. and, and pick at the FDA. None of, none of that crap any of us want to do, but at the same time, right. this is a huge problem that, that the average man and woman walking the street need to know about. Yeah, and the other thing I would say, you know, um, super important for doctors to understand this, and some doctors do. So that's like a little piece of good news. I have found that doctors particularly who, um, who are prescribing narrow therapeutic index drugs so, right. you know, the endocrinologists and cardiologists and neurologists, they understand this because um, very small alterations in dosages can have a huge, yeah. you know, impact on their patient's well-being and even their life. 
Yeah, some um, drugs have a very wide yeah. therapeutic index, and as right. long as you're bouncing around in there, it's safe and fine. But other drugs, two of which that come to mind are heparin and yeah. meodorone, uh, coumadin. There's yeah. a very narrow therapeutic yeah. index, and if you get outside that index, there's going to be a, a potentially devastating medical mm-hmm. complication from that. Yeah, so um, my book tells the story um, of a doctor at the Cleveland Clinic named Harry Lever, who really began to track and understand this. And he saw that patients who he had stabilized were suddenly becoming unstable in in really troubling ways. And he was able to link that to changes in their medication. Um, And he, he, you know, his, he now sees his job as not only um, kind of diagnosing his patients, but diagnosing the drug supply. So he has figured out kind of which companies are making drugs that are potentially harming his patients. And wow. he's, he's, you know, so there are, you know, this is not to say that all generics are bad, but some of them certainly are being made by companies that are not playing by the rules. Of that there is no doubt. Wow. It's unbelievable. Has it gotten any better? Has anything changed at the federal level with the FDA or with the companies in other countries manufacturing these drugs? Have you had any impact besides pissing a lot of, of people off? That is true. I have pissed off a lot of people. Um, <laughs> me too, me too. Yeah, I've pissed off a lot of people. And in fact, before I went, I went to India for a book tour and uh, the Modi government threatened to take action against me and my book. They called it fiction-filled stories. Um, so, uh, but... When my book came out, um, Congress began to hold hearings. So they have held hearings on this issue. Um, You know, I mean, I think there is this very open question of whether we're in a moment in time where anything can get solved. And then, you know, coronavirus happened. And so now um, what we're seeing, we're seeing the FDA go backward because they are basically, you know, companies that they restricted from selling into the U.S. market, they're now lifting those restrictions um, on those bad actor companies. And they're lifting them because they're trying to source drugs. So that is really not a good uh, direction to be moving in. Right. But And so they're under immense pressure to get these drugs manufactured and in the country ASAP. And again, guys, if you missed it the first time, they're actually lifting sanctions on the literal companies that Catherine talked about in her book who were sanctioned. They're saying, oh, just forget that. We need you to make a bunch of azithromycin for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, and and the concern, the concern is also, you know, there's the immediate concern that this is going to allow substandard drugs into our, our country. But the other concern is you're creating a precedent whereby you're saying you're lowering standards. And it's like, how's that going to help us? Right. Um, Really, the ultimate solution to this is to make our own drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or at least to have better oversight. I mean, even if the FDA just popped open each container and chose every fifth box and said, okay, we're going to test this. And if if it's not, if it doesn't come up to 95% standards, we're sending the whole shipment back. I mean, if they would just do that occasionally, yeah, that that cost of doing business would at yeah. least cause those companies in India and China to step it up at least a little bit, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's basically what you're saying is, um, we need to create a system with real verification. We got to yeah. get rid of an honor system. Yes. And have a system of real <clears throat> checks. That's and I understand that it's hugely expensive to send a couple of FDA agents to India to, to investigate a plan. I, I could see just that's a logistical nightmare and they're trying to trick you and take you out mm-hmm. to dinner and, and probably other things too. But at the border, at the border, the FDA could make just random, unannounced mm-hmm. checks of shipments yeah. of drugs coming in. And if, if it became known in other countries that they're going to do that, you're going to get caught sooner or later. And then when you get sanctioned, the sanctions actually going to mean something to you financially. It's not going to be lifted a month later when the FDA needs something from you. Yeah. Well, you know, so here's here's something to think about and to wrap your mind around, which is um, 
why does why don't the big pharmacy chains test the drugs they dispense? You and know, rats, right? I mean, yeah. you know, you've got the, this whole the honor system is all the way down, right? If the FDA says it's okay, then everybody assumes it's okay, and right. then nobody checks anything. And all of the big insurance companies require people to use generics. Right. Uh, I just saw a news article today that United Healthcare just they, they just had made five billion dollars in profit because people weren't going to the doctor and and for the routine checkups. But I'll bet you United Healthcare is not going to give everybody a rebate. I bet they're still going to charge you that monthly thing you got to pay sure. every month. But yeah. wouldn't it behoove them since they require their members mm -hmm. to take generics? Shouldn't it, I mean? Is there? I wonder if there's some class action recourse of United Healthcare, not just them, but Blue Blue. Oh yeah, all the big uh, insurance agency. Is there some class action remedy that the consumers, the patients, can take and say, "Hey, you forced me to take generic medications for five, 10, 15, 20 years, and you didn't verify that they were even real medication." Yeah. That's, um, you know, that's a great I'd idea. Like there might be some legal liability there. Yeah, I think that that is a great idea. You know, but the problem is, I think pr probably at this point they're insulated from accountability because they can say the FDA verified it. Right? That's the problem. But they know about it. But they could technically right. say that, right? Because that is the FDA's job. God forbid they actually do that. Right. Wow. You know, wow. so I I think I, I have concluded that what really what is needed is a consumer revolution. Ah. You know? I like the way you talk. Consumers, consumers need to understand this and do something about it. And I'll tell you just this one thought, which is, you know, as I was traveling all around the world reporting this book, and I was in India and China and Africa and all over the place, and everywhere I went, I was in taxi cabs, and everybody wore a seatbelt. And I looked at that and I was like, okay, that's a consumer revolution. Everybody understands it and everybody's wearing a seatbelt. And we need that kind of, we need that big of a consumer revolution here for people to demand quality medicines, you yep. know? Yep. Absolutely. And yeah, the, the class action lawsuit idea just came to me. Yeah. That happens to me often when I'm in the heat of the moment. <laughs> but I mean, a couple of threats of that, and I'll bet you magically that, that Blue Cross yeah. Blue Field and Aetna and Cigna and United Healthcare would say, you know what we're going to start doing to protect our members? Right. Uh, translation, protect our, our financial ass. We're going to yeah. start randomly testing these generic drugs that we've been making you take, take for the last 10 years yeah. because we care about you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. that'd be great. You know, you know what? I will say this, which is, Nobody seems to have studied what the actual cost is of these generic drugs. I mean, my contention has long been that there's a hidden cost, right? Because patients are getting readmitted to the hospital. I mean, I write about that in Bottle of Lies that heart transplant patients were getting switched to a low cost immunosuppressant made in India and they were winding up back in the ICU. So if you had some real studies which showed that there was a hidden cost to this low cost medicine, I think the insurers might get with the program pretty quickly. That's a great idea. I love that. I love that because if you're going to be breaking in billions of dollars of profit, yeah. uh, you better damn well be accountable to these people that you say you care for. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I love that idea. Any any closing thoughts, Catherine, that, that you'd like to leave people with? Anything about your upcoming projects or anything at all? Well, yeah, sure. Um, so the paperback for Bottle of Lies comes out now. It's going to be in toward the end of June. Um, I have a TED Med talk, which is all about this, which is going to come out probably Beautiful. around the same time. Um, you know, I'm going to be writing about the federal response to this outbreak as it goes along. Um, and, you know, I just, I would urge consumers to educate themselves, to pay attention to what they're taking, you know, to get some knowledge on this topic, uh, to really be able to better protect themselves.
Yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much for this book. It's uh, I, I do a lot of reading and I've listened to your book on Audible three times. Awesome. Love it. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm really spoiled. It's hard for me to sit down and read a book anymore. I have to, uh, my ADD kicks in. I have to be doing something <laughs> while I'm listening to a book. And I was reading, I was listening to your book and literally I would stop what I was doing and I'd just be like, are you effing kidding me? Are you, are you serious right now? Wow. Because we all, we all suspect that these things go on yeah. at the upper levels of, of big pharma and big government. But for you to lay it out, like, no, this is not the conspiracy theory. This is not yeah. dramatic. Here's the black and white. I think yeah. that's very powerful to help people understand that uh, we can make this better. It's not going to be easy or cheap. Yeah. But we can make this better. But, man, what a mess. What a mess. Somebody yeah. bring a broom. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right, Catherine. Thank you Great so much. Great to talk to you, Ken. I really appreciate it. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Yeah, everybody stay, everybody stay home and, and cough into your sleep. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Okay, Karen. thank you. Great to All talk. Right. All right, guys, there you have it. Now, I put the link to uh, Catherine Ebon's book, Bottle of Lies, in the show notes down below on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, also, a link to her website where you can actually go and hopefully try to tease out where your prescription drug was manufactured. Uh, that may or may not work because some of the some of these companies are so secretive. Uh, you'd think the FDA would be not allow them to be secretive, but they do. And so you may or may not be able to. But at least in, in any case, you can perhaps switch to a generic made by a company who is at least somewhat trustworthy. And I think that'll that'll be good for your health. Hopefully, you're using your diet to eliminate as many unnecessary drugs as you possibly can. But uh, some of us, we still are on one blood pressure pill a day or this one pill or that one pill. But if you're taking that one pill and it's a generic, you need to go check out katherineebond.com and, and see if you can figure out who makes it and are they reputable. Um, I think that's it for today. Thanks so much for joining me. Please share this video to help me to help other people. That's really the only way I can reach new people is if you share this video on YouTube or Facebook or in an email or WhatsApp or whatever. That way, people who've never heard this, have, who have no idea that this danger is sitting right there in their medicine cabinet, they will get a heads up from you because you love them. All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. This is Dr. Barry. I'll see you next time.